Okay, thanks, Linda. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Growing Concerns for July the 3rd. And uh, for today's webinar, uh, we're uh, going to go over a few of the things, again, that have been happening over the past week and uh, I guess what some of the things we can maybe be watching for for this, uh, for this coming week as well. And uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, little bit about our crops update uh, and then get into some of the issues we're seeing with wet conditions and then talk a little bit about diseases and insects and some, some insects that we need to uh, maybe be watching for. And, uh, but uh, to start off uh, with the crops update, and uh, really uh, these last couple of days with heat, you sure notice a lot of the crops starting to, uh, to grow a lot faster. Uh, you're definitely seeing it in the corn. Uh, it's jumping uh, really well. Sunflowers are doing well right now too. They're liking this heat. Um, and so uh, those crops are coming along fairly well. Um, Regarding uh, most of the other crops, uh, I think spraying-wise, uh, producers are getting caught up. Uh, some guys are still uh, trying to get to some of those late seeded fields, and now with the wet conditions, they're starting to run into some problems with uh, with getting stuck in some of the fields still. But uh, by the weekend or after the weekend, I can see uh, a lot of the spraying being caught up. Uh, Seems like always we're uh, we're getting uh, flax uh, where guys are still just spraying their flax right now, and it always seems like every year it seems like uh, the heat of the year or the hottest time of the year we're landing to having spray flax, and, uh, and then a couple fields yesterday where uh, you can definitely see where uh, the chemical was having a pretty hard effect on on the flax crop. So if you still have flax out there to spray. Uh, best to be spraying it in the evenings and then letting it uh, at least have most of the evening uh, to uh, uh, work its way through some of the uh, the burn of the chemical and uh, and then you get maybe less impact on the crop. Uh, this time of year with this kind of heat, it uh, doesn't matter what you spray, you're probably still going to see some uh, some crop injury to the to the flax. With um, uh, some of the winter wheat crops, uh, we're seeing, uh, these are the pictures uh, from uh, last week for uh, the Elmers area up in the Shoal Lake area. And last week the, the winter wheat was just nicely starting to uh, go into the shop later flag leaf stage. And uh, this field has come on, we've been kind of watching it all year. And uh, this is what uh, it looks like uh, this morning. So definitely uh, Heading out already, uh, I would say, you know, we're probably from the next one here, you could see about 50% in head. So it's uh, pretty much, uh, like Elmer mentions, uh, pretty much uh, timing for fusarium control when you're seeing that many heads already uh, across the field. So uh, I guess that's one of the diseases that uh, producers should be uh, out preparing for uh, when you look at the and I should have put it on the webinar this morning, but the uh, fusarium map for uh, southwest, uh, pretty much for the southern part of the province and uh, as far north as, uh, you know, basically right through to Dolphin area, the fusarium risk rating is, is, uh, is red, so basically meaning that we have perfect conditions for fusarium and uh, so producers need to be uh, looking at fields. Uh, the early, uh, early seeded uh, wheat fields are starting to head as well. So you know, within the next uh, 10 days or so, we'll be seeing a fair bit of uh, fusarium control going on. Uh, I was in fields of wheat yesterday, uh, and uh, right through till one o'clock in the afternoon, the uh, they were still uh, wet in the fields from uh, uh, you know just from the moisture from the rains we've been getting. So they definitely have, uh, the canopies are staying uh, wet for a long period of time. So the potential for fusarium to be an issue is there with the humidity we have. And uh, timing wise, I guess is one thing that we need to, uh, to keep on top of when we're going to be going out there spraying for fusarium. Otherwise, we're just going to get leaf control with a lot of the products. But uh, you know, once you see, uh, this is a winter wheat field I was in yesterday, and you can see the uh, the head, uh, this one head was flowering. This was uh, one of the uh, the earlier heads that come out. You can see the one next to it wasn't flowering yet, and this was just kind of nicely uh, 
way the heads flowers, they'll flower from the middle and go up and down and basically what's happening here is as the blooms close you can see the petals uh, are falling off. So this is actually completed flowering already so when you're seeing these petals in this type of stage uh, you're, you're past the stage of an application for fusarium control because the blooms are closing at this time. So you just need to be watching your fields. Um, it's always, uh, I guess, been said that uh, with uh, lots of heat, uh, flowering will happen uh, fast. So our window for spraying is going to be, when you look at the weather over the next few days, our window for spraying for fusarium uh, on some of these early seeded fields is going to be smaller just because of the fact that uh, the wheat isn't going to flower as long as it normally would. and uh, uh, therefore, we would have less days to cover those acres. But uh, I guess nevertheless, uh, even if you miss uh, some of the fusarium uh, timing, you still would be getting uh, leaf disease control. And uh, this is the winter wheat field uh, that was in yesterday again. And you could see that some of the levels of leaf disease are fairly high. Uh, this was probably one of the extreme leaves that I uh, took a close-up of this one, but you could definitely see a lot of issues with tan spot and septoria on those leaves. And that's the flag leaf. So, you know, there's uh, probably, if you were to do a percentage there, you know, you're the high 30s to 40 percent of that leaf is already covered with uh, some type of disease. So, you're going to need that leaf to help that plant fill. So, uh, uh, with the conditions we're having right now, uh, you know, I would say that it would be advisable to be uh, ready to, to be putting fungicides on, uh, especially if the crop uh, has made it through these wet conditions as, and is in fairly good shape. And truthfully, from the fields I've been in over the last little while here, it seems like the cereal crops have uh, weathered the uh, the, the high moisture conditions a lot better than a lot of the oil seed crops and uh, I guess because of that we have a fairly heavy canopy out there and, and with that it's going to be longer time period for those uh, those canopies to dry out and we need them to dry out for the disease to slow down so uh, potential for disease again is going to be high whether it's fusarium or whether it's just uh, your leaf diseases and when you look in the background of this picture, you can see uh, this leaf here has still has got quite a bit on it. So this was probably the extreme, but most of the leaves were showing some type of spotting. So uh, again, it's uh, something that we should be uh, gearing up for for this coming week. As I mentioned, the, um, the uh, cereal crops seem to have uh, weathered the wet conditions a lot better than uh, our oilseed crops and uh, getting a lot of phone calls uh, over the past week here uh, basically just wondering what's going on with the canola fields and we've seen several of these fields around uh, where you've got uh, a lot of open ground, uh, you've got uh, canola starting to bolt when it's uh, barely cabbaged out and covered the ground uh, and and almost in some cases seems that we've lost some of these plants as well. And uh, I'm going to go through a few of the issues as to why we're seeing this and maybe help explain some of the, some of the issues that are out there with, uh, with the canola fields. I guess one of the things is with the wet soils causing an oxygen deficiency in the, in the ground and which reduces the roots respiration and, and growth and uh, if your roots aren't working, uh, that's where you know the, your nutrients are uptaken into the plant, and so without the roots working, your plant eventually dies because it's uh, lack of nutrients. And uh, so, in some of those areas where we're seeing dead plants right now, and then we see some good plants, and then some dead plants, we're probably seeing areas where water has sat for a long enough period of time that those plants just couldn't uh, couldn't survive anymore and and they're dying off and uh, so we're seeing uh, some of those bare patches in the field right now uh, caused by that uh, but we're also seeing some of those bare patches caused by a few other things that I'll, I'll get into as we go through this uh, this part of the presentation so water logging also is causing some premature bolting and uh, and flowering as a survival response to the stress so because the plants are under stress from the high moisture, and even though this shot here doesn't look like uh, there looks like there's a lot of moisture out there, 
when you start digging up these uh, these plants uh, or the around the root systems of some of these plants, it's uh, basically a ball of mud in the ground. So there's lots of moisture in the ground still. So you can see where these plants were under some stress uh, from from moisture during uh, during part of the the wet conditions here, and and because of that, um, there's a natural response for plants to produce. Uh, seed when they feel that they're going to uh, get into something stressing them or their their life cycle is going to be shortened. So that's why what we're seeing in the, some of the canola crops right now is uh, we're seeing that premature bolting and it's it's caused by uh, by the uh, the stress put on it from the extra from the moisture. Now the you know the moisture was one of the stresses put on it, but there was also some other stresses put on it through the growing season and. Um, so uh, you know, uh, producers are asking, well, is there anything we can do with uh, with these plants, or what can we do to you know maybe make uh, try to improve this crop? And uh, there is some potential if the if the canola crop has survived, and I think that's the first thing you need to go out there and and assess uh, the stand you have uh, remaining. Uh, some of the fields I've been in, the stand is you know if anything average to. Uh, to below average right now, but if you still have a fairly decent stand where you're still getting, you know, that, you know, eight plants per square foot, those type of situations, then uh, the application of uh, of nitrogen right now might not be a bad thing because one of the issues that uh, we um, uh, we've seen is because of the 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 high amounts of moisture we receive, we see got some leaching of of nutrients out of the uh, out of the root zone, and so we're starting to see some deficiencies showing up in the plants that are left remaining because their root systems haven't got down into into the uh, into the uh, the layer, or they're not now in that layer of nutrients that we we applied when we put the fur when we planted the crop. Now, how much did you put on? Well, again, it's going to depend a lot on on your ability to get it on, but uh, and to put it. To, to get the application on, but I guess one of the big things you need to remember is the majority of the uh, nutrients that the plant is going to take up is going to be through its root system. So a lot of the uh, foliar applications, uh, you know, they uh, they may help. They may make the plants uh, turn a little bit greener and and get them going, and maybe help the root systems get into that nutrient layer that uh, has leached away from them. Uh, if you're showing severe deficiencies, you know maybe a dribble band would be better than uh, than a foliar application because again the amount of nitrogen or or the amount of nutrients you're going to get in a foliar is actually fairly limited. So again, the majority of the, the nutrients are taken up by the root system, but uh, again every situation is going to be a little bit different, and uh, you know maybe an application of a foliar might might be all you need is to get that plant going. So with nutrient losses, um, growers uh, probably can expect, uh, you know, if you get extended heavy rains like we did get over the last little while here, you could see losses of uh, nutrients of anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. Uh, and again, with the worst areas being your low low spots in the field, and we all see that because that's where all the ponding happens, and that's where, you know, we're seeing uh, the majority of uh, of crop loss as well. I guess one thing you need to remember too is if your your areas have been uh, saturated for a while, and I showed that earlier on with some of the pictures where we're actually seeing some canola plants that are are dying off. Um, that means you you've got a thinner crop out there, so there still may be enough nitrogen in that uh, that layer to uh, to feed the plants that re are remaining. So. I guess that's what I was getting at when I was talking about is it going to be advantageous to go out there and do another application of uh, a fertilizer if, uh, if you have a, a heavy stand still left or an adequate stand still left then yeah you may see some benefits. If you have uh, a less than adequate stand there may be a, enough nitrogen remaining in the soil that where an application may not show much response at all. So when I was talking a little bit earlier, I was uh, mentioning that you know there's probably several reasons why that uh, some of those uh, uh, those crops are bolting right now, and and one of the main reasons is the 
the, the stress we did get from the excess moisture. But there's also a few other things that happened this spring to a lot of those fields that uh, are probably making it want to bolt as well. Uh, seeding into too much straw this spring and we had cold soils and uh, those cold soils hung around for a long period of time this year and that affected the growth rate of our canola plants and a lot of those plants germinated, came through the ground and kind of just sat there for a while and didn't do a whole bunch. Now a lot of those plants also went through uh, the frost we had so you know some areas uh, had a couple nights of frost and so that's that slowed those plants down a fair bit and stressed them. A lot of those plants uh, at that time also had a lot of flea beetle damage or flea beetle feeding going on. And uh, you know, in some cases, not just feeding on the leaves, feeding on the stems. We had some fairly high populations in some areas, and it seemed like when you threw in the combination of the frost and then the feeding on the stems and the leaves, uh, we put another stress on 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 those plants and. Uh, and it just seemed that uh, those plants could never, never win this year. And uh, after you get the, the, you know, just recovering from the flea beetle damage, we get four to, four to six inches of rain on it. Uh, and uh, the, you know, kind of the, the, the last stress that kind of caused a lot of those, uh, those fields to, uh, you know, plants just to be, think that they, you know, need to start bolting. So I think that's. You throw those combinations together, and I think that's uh, that's one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of bolting in some of these fields and 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 poorer stems. Late spring or or no burn off at all in some fields is an issue too. You're uh, seeing some fields where some of the weed, weed populations got a little bit away from the guys, and uh, and because of that, uh, we're we're seeing competition from from weeds as well. So. Uh, you know, it's uh, it definitely uh, definitely shows when you look at some of the later seeded fields, where some of the producers uh, either work the ground to try to dry it out so they could get on some of those fields, or the those areas just are those later seeded fields. Uh, the soil just had a little bit longer of a period of time uh, for the soil to warm up, and those canola plants are the fields that were sown later. Um, the plants were up in a short period of time and got going and uh, just were able to develop and, and cabbage and cover the ground. A lot of those later seeded fields too uh, didn't see the uh, extreme stress of uh, some of the uh, flea beetle damage and they definitely missed the frost. So you know those fields right now are, uh, are, looking, uh, are looking like this. Uh, you know, and and you can see that see it. It's uh, it's it's in areas where you've got some fields that are looking like the previous pictures, where there's bolting, and you could walk through the field and not step on a plant. And then you uh, look at a field like this, which is in the same area, just so on, you know, a week to ten days later, and uh, it's a completely different field, and kind of the way uh, canola canola should look at uh, at this time of year. So. Uh, I think that's one of the issues, or that's what's really going on with some of the canola crops out there. And uh, and uh, it's not just the canola crops. Uh, I was in some flax crops yesterday as well, and some of the flax crops uh, are yellowing as well. Uh, flax does not like uh, wet feet, and uh, we're seeing a lot of the yellowing there. And then, like I mentioned a little bit earlier on, uh, the uh, combination of wet feet and then going out there and doing your weed control right there and now in flax is uh, is creating some issues as well and and peas uh, was in some pea fields yesterday that were also uh, showing uh, stresses from uh, from extreme moisture and uh, you know uh, this is a field where uh, uh, was uh, with the field that was sown the day after this one uh, looks uh, looks 100% better and uh, no yellowing in it anywhere. But uh, this field uh, sown into heavier trash, uh, so the ground was colder. Uh, even though it was sown earlier, uh, it came up two to three days later uh, than the other field. Uh, this one also uh, probably had two to three inches more rain and the past events than, than the, the field you went to next. So uh, you know you throw all those combinations together and you, uh, you're definitely seeing uh, 
seeing some uh, where the peas are just can't handle all the stresses that are happening right now. Kind of interesting when you look at these plants and uh, we started digging up the, the, the roots and looking at trying to find a modulation on the roots. Uh, we we're seeing real poor root development in these areas and like I mentioned earlier on with, uh, with these, uh, this, some of the areas when you start digging up some of these plants, uh, it's just a, a, a clay ball or a ball of dirt that's just all just soaking wet, just completely saturated this ground still. And this was, you know, three to four days after since the last rainfall at least. And, uh, and it's still taking that long to, to dry the soil out. And uh, kind of interesting, a lot of trash on this, this, uh, this field. And it's taking longer to, uh, to dry this, this field out than it was in the other fields we were in in the same area just for the fact that uh, the straw is covering the ground and, and keeping that moisture there. Now, as you look a little bit closer, you can see that, that there's very poor nodulation uh, to up, actually none on, on some of these uh, plants that were in the, uh, the poorer areas. So right now, when you looked at uh, those, those uh, pea plants, they're definitely looking like a nutrient deficiency where it's showing up the yellowing of the leaves. Um, it uh, usually you know, affect the, the older leaves first. And when you look at the, uh, the tops of the plants, uh, you're seeing green still, and uh, and then as you get down into the older leaves, you're seeing uh, it's starting to show uh, the yellowing, which is uh, you know kind of the perfect way as the way a deficiency would be working. Interesting when we're in that same field, and we go to an area where the plants are good and healthy, and dig up them, uh, we can definitely see uh, good nodules uh, showing up. On, uh, on the on the on the root systems, and uh, and basically just uh, you know what you want to see in in pea plants, uh, you want to see a good uh, good development of nodules and a good healthy plants. So uh, you know, so what do you do if you've got a field like this and uh, you want to see if you can uh, help those areas that are are looking like. Uh, looking like this, well, you know, uh, I think with this producer, what we were planning on doing and, and thinking he's going to do is maybe go on and put on some, uh, see if he can dribble down some nitrogen on some of those areas and see if we can get the peas to respond to some nitrogen and maybe uh, bring back some of those yellow areas or at least reduce some of those yellow areas in the field. And uh, I convinced him to leave a, leave a strip so we can, uh, we can see uh, if there's going to be any benefits from it as well. So. It'll uh, be interesting to check that field in uh, in a week or so. He's uh, hoping to get it done uh, later on today. We also uh, were um, were uh, seeing yesterday uh, some uh, some fields that, and I think we talked a bit about this last week, where we talked about some hail that went through some of the areas. Well, some of the areas uh, were still showing some. Uh, some damage from uh, some hail damage in some of the fields, and this oats field here had some hail damage. And uh, and last year we had the same uh, same kind of issue show up in some of the fields south of Cirrus, where we had a fairly good hailstorm go through, and then within about a week's time we did, we seen uh, a lot of the oats turning a, a brownish type uh, off yellow type color in the in the fields and. Uh, and uh, you could definitely see it, uh, you know, see it from the road. And uh, sent samples with last year, it came back as bacterial blight, and uh, so and uh, and the halo blight is what it was. And uh, kind of like a secondary thing, you had an injury in the plant, and if you've got high moisture conditions like uh, like we have right now, uh, blights are going to be one thing that are going to be fairly prominent. So uh, you know. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, we uh, we can be seeing in some of the fields. So if you're out in some of the oats fields and seeing uh, some of this type of uh, spotting or black uh, brownish type uh, spotting on leaves and stuff, you're probably seeing some uh, some bacterial blight that's uh, showing up. Ninety-nine percent of the time, I know last year we didn't uh, do any spraying on any of these fields. Uh, uh, at that stage because it was early on, just like this field, it's still not in the flag leaf stage. And uh, you look at the new leaves or the leaves that are just coming out and they are, they're perfect. There's no, uh, no damage to them at all. 
and uh, usually it'll outgrow uh, a disease like this and with the, grow the growing conditions we have I, I don't see it being much of an issue so um, with, uh, with that I would say give it some time and then if the producers going to go in later on and apply a fungicide to his oats uh, for some of the other uh, diseases a little bit later on at uh, flagly stage, then uh, you know he'll be uh, be better off than trying to panic and do something about it right now. A little bit about soybeans. Uh, they uh, definitely seem to be, uh, once again, handling the moisture a lot better than a lot of the other crops in the area and the heat that we've been getting over the last couple of days is definitely showing uh, that these, uh, this uh, is a heat loving crop because it's jumping like crazy which is, uh, which is good to see and uh, we were concerned that we were uh, fairly uh, late getting some of these in and then with uh, it germinating fairly slow because of the cool ground and growing fairly slow uh, we were concerned that you know maybe we'd be running out of days but it seems like with the heat we're getting right now, it definitely looks like it's, uh, it's catching and, and, and going. Just a little bit of a close-up here, you can see where you're probably going to be getting some, uh, some flowering happening soon on some of these plants and uh, with that we're going to see some, some pod production. So as the plants start to mature and start to grow here, that'll be, uh, you know, we need one them to get to a certain height before they, they start producing. That's usually where you know the goal when you for planting them is to get them to grow at a certain height before they start producing pods. These ones are going to be okay. They're at least two to three inches off the ground is before they're going to start. So, so it's uh, it's as you know as good as it, it can be for this year with the with the kind of the extremes in weather we've been having. Every uh, week, I've uh, been using or getting a doing an update on the uh, on kind of the rainfall throughout the uh, the the area here, and uh, a little bit about the growing degree days and our our corn heat units, and just to see where we are as a percent of normal. And uh, when you look at our growing degree days, uh, we've uh, we basically came up to where we're right around normal right now and which is which is good and I can see where you know if we throw in what's going to happen this this next week here we can probably see ourselves even jumping in above normal over the next week so so that's a good thing for uh, a lot of the crop uh, we have the moisture and uh, what we need right now is for some uh, some heat to uh, get the crop growing and uh, and the other thing too that we're noticing is our evenings aren't cooling off as much either, so we're definitely getting long growing days now, which is going to have an effect on, on a lot of the crops and we're going to see them advancing fairly fast. When you look at our rainfall, uh, you know, basically we're above normal in, in 90 percent of our locations, uh, you know, except for say Glenboro and uh, and Russell, uh, but besides that, everybody reporting over 100% of normal, or over over the, the you know over the our normal amounts anyway. So uh, so we definitely have uh, lots of rainfall, and I guess we've been been hearing about that over the last while here that you know we can do without rain for uh, for a while here. Actually, you know if we could go a few till uh, till we're you know right in the heading stage, just a nice shower to help the heads fill out uh, would be great, but, uh, for the, but for now we can go a few days without rain, that's for sure. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about today too was, um, was the wheat midge and uh, with, uh, um, I guess, uh, Every year we have, uh, you know, some issues with uh, with the wheat production, whether it be fusarium, and some areas uh, there's uh, midge has been more of an issue, and uh, it tends to be something that uh, when we get to this time of year where we're spraying for everything else, we tend to a little forget about it for a little bit there. And I thought it'd be a good thing to to talk about, being that we're getting kind of right into that time where when you're out scouting your fields for timing for fusarium. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, to check and scout for these guys. Best way of scouting for these guys is uh, usually in the evenings. Um, they're a fairly uh, light-winged fly, uh, almost mosquito-type looking, 
and I'll have some other pictures as we go through this, but uh, they, uh, they're they not very strong flyers, so they don't like wind conditions. So um, what they're re uh, calling for this afternoon with 40 to 50 kilometer winds or whatever, uh, you probably won't see them in the afternoon, but if you go out in the evening when the wind goes down, and uh, pretty much when it's perfect time for mosquitoes to be out there like crazy, that'll be the time when you'll find uh, be able to find the wheat niche and uh, once you uh, train your eye to, to see them, uh, they're, they're not too hard to find. One of the things about wheat midge is they do work a bit by uh, growing degree days and uh, so when you look at to when they're going to emerge and become, uh, you know, issues, I guess, uh, uh, basically the, the, um, when they're, we're probably almost right in the, uh, the point right now where we're going to be seeing them uh, starting to emerge because when you look at our our growing degree days, we're in that you know six you know six hundred range, and probably within the next you know week to two weeks here, we're going to see that jump to an area where we're going to see a lot of them starting to emerge, and I guess that's when uh, we're going to need to uh, be looking out for control wise. Uh, they do the damage when the um, when the wheat is flowering, uh, so they need the glooms to be open, <clears throat> and that's where that's how they lay their eggs. Is they lay them in the glooms, or in between the glooms as the, the the wheat is flowering, and that's when you need to be doing your control when they're out there. So uh, we might uh, the early wheat uh, this year uh, might be getting uh, away from that, uh, but anything that's going to be, you know, heading within the next. Uh, 10 days, 10 to 14 days might be right in, in that time period where we'll be seeing a lot of the uh, females starting to emerge and uh, that will be when we'd be looking at having the most damage done. You get a lot of calls uh, a lot of years when guys are out scouting and they, uh, they see uh, uh, another fly out there that's, uh, that's orange and looks like a wheat midge. You see the one on the right I mentioned it's kind of like a mosquito type looking fly with, with clear wings and really small body, well that's your wheat midge. The Luxanid is uh, the one on the, on the left and uh, we get a lot of calls every year that, you know, I'm seeing those orange orange flies out in my field, you know, we better get spraying. The Luxanids are usually fairly easy to see and they are uh, a bigger body. Uh, this is one that I took a, a, a couple of years ago, I think it was, but uh, they are not as uh, they don't fly as fast. They don't. Uh, they're not as uh, uh, I guess scared. I guess you can call it when you're out in the field. You can definitely see them sitting on leaves, and they're not going to be flying away very fast as compared to the uh, the wheat midge. It uh, it tends to be moving around steady, almost like a, a mosquito, and doesn't like to sit in one spot very long. So it's continually bouncing around. So it's uh, it's something where it's a little bit harder to defined, it's about half the size, and again, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one that uh, will be around just around flowering time, so that's when we'll be look, doing most of our scouting for it. Elmer sent me this picture uh, of the hemp field. Last week we had a picture of that uh, the hemp crop, and I didn't get a chance to put it in, but this stuff has probably jumped a foot and a half to two feet since last week's picture. So uh, hemp and also another crop that definitely likes the uh, the warm conditions for growing. So uh, this field is definitely filling filling in and is going to make a heck of a crop. And seeing this out there yesterday as well, and it was uh, you know just basically saying that things are still fairly wet depending on where you are and. Uh, you know, some areas did receive a lot more rainfall than other areas, and it's going to be interesting doing our fungicide applications. So you're going to need to be careful as to where you're driving out there. But uh, I guess with that, uh, again, I didn't have uh, uh, everybody or a lot of a lot of people are busy right now, and uh, we get uh, a lot of calls. But it seems like we're getting a lot of the the same calls, so especially over this past week regarding you know what's going on with the canola crop, and I thought we could address that and uh, and I guess that's uh, that's everything that I I had for today so uh, Linda is there any questions no Lionel I don't have any questions at this time okay well 
Regarding the CCA credits, again, uh, if you're wanting to uh, get uh, CCA credits, this one is going to be for integ integrated pest management. And uh, if you watch the webinar, just a short summary of what was talked about, and if you email it to uh, Linda, I would say would be the best because she keeps track of all that. And uh, there's my contact information as well as Linda's contact information. And as always, the contact information for the FBAs in Southwest and South Parkland, uh, Almer, Murray, Amir, Melissa, and Andrea. So uh, if you're seeing issues out in the field or you've got questions about what's going on, uh, don't be uh, afraid to give these guys a call or, or get a hold of myself or Linda, and we'll give you a hand. With that, I think if there's no questions, we'll end the webinar.